Okay, let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Looking this morning as we continue our sermon series in the life of Christ from Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Bibles are all around the place, and if you didn't bring one, we have one for you, so just go ahead and snag that. Mark 1, 9 through 13, and as we come to this text and contemplate these verses in Mark's gospel, it, it, it's, it's really just two different items here. It's the simple record of Jesus' baptism, water baptism. That's the first part. Second part is the temptation of Jesus. And this is by far the short version. And Mark, once again, Mark is really, in my opinion, one of the Gospels to have someone read that's just new to understanding who Jesus is or wants to understand who Jesus is because it's, it's kind of like the bullet point version of all of the Gospels. And then you take Mark and then you launch into, hey, if you want to know the theological aspect of all of this, well, then you go into John. And then you, 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 you go into Matthew to find out, you know, why he is the fulfillment of really the, the Old Testament. And you have all of these different things, but Mark is just the simple activity of Christ. And as we do this, you may have noticed there was a, a theme running through the music that was selected today, and that, that theme is love. It's the deepest, the most sublime, the most consequential topic in theology. It's the greatest, most incomprehensible theme that you could ever consider. It's not just any love that we're contemplating this morning. This here, we are contemplating the greatest and the highest love there is. The love of the Almighty God, God the Father, for His only Son, Jesus Christ. And I say to you that we can only begin to comprehend in this life a tiny, tiny bit the Father's love for the Son. And we're going to spend, when you think about this, we're going to spend all eternity drinking in this infinite fountainhead of God the Father loves God the Son. The Father loves the Son. The dimensions of that love, you only can begin to probe in this life. I, I only have maybe one kabillion, I'm making up stuff, part of an understanding of how great the Father's love is for the Son. And I think we need to understand that. So let's dive right in in verse 9. Now it happened that in those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens, you are my beloved Son. You are my beloved Son. In you, I am well pleased. Now, people praise their spouses all the time. I absolutely love and adore my wife. I do. People get thrilled about saying, man, I was, I was on the field last night, took pictures with, with such and such baseball player. And I mean, I love that baseball player. Favorite books. Friends. But at the pinnacle of all loves is the ultimate love in the universe, the love of God. The love of God the Father for His only Son. It's the love that preceded them all, and God wants to include us. Include us in that love. Now, God likes to tell people He loves people. 
and is proud of them. If you can remember this in the Old Testament, God says to Satan at the beginning of the book of Job, he says, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He's blameless and he's upright. He's a man who fears God, shuns evil. God loved to tell people about Job. There is no one like him. Well, multiply that by a billion times a billion and you have a fraction of the loving pride that you see in this three verses of this section right here. Have you considered my son Jesus? There's no one like him. He's the one I love. And with him, I am well pleased. Now, in all of this, of course, we have to somehow take our finite minds and wrap them around really what part of the topic that's in here, and that's the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity. We Christians believe in one God that eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, were we Christians to teach that there were three gods... The world really would have no difficulties in understanding that concept because most people on this planet believe in multiple gods. They'd have no difficulty understanding the concept because most faiths are polytheistic. Three separate gods interacting in certain ways, they'd be like, hey, I get it. I get to pick then. But the clear revelation of the Bible in the Old Covenant, again and again, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is what? One. Ten chapters in Isaiah are given to that. Isaiah 40 through 49. God's fierce jealousy about the polytheism of his people as they mixed worship of of Yahweh together with other gods. And he's saying, absolutely not. I am God. There is no other. There's no one like me. But the idea that there is one God that exists in three persons, co-equal, co-eternal, is probably the greatest mystery of the Christian faith. I would argue that none of us would come up with it. It could never be come, we we just wouldn't come up with it. Human science wouldn't have come up with it. Human philosophy would not come up with the Trinity. The Trinity was revealed by God himself. And the revelation of the Trinity is most clearly displayed that the human here, that the human race, the person of Jesus, the understanding of the deity of Christ, of what that means, that Jesus is the Son of God, or God the Son, and the Trinity flows out from that even here, and it centers on that. And this is another one of those clear revelations of the concept of the Trinity in the baptism of Jesus The person of Jesus at the center receiving baptism from John the Baptist. And I I actually, the ESV, I, I like the wording there a little bit better. Because it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open. The heavens being torn open. The Holy Spirit descending as a dove on Jesus. And then a voice, a powerful voice coming down from heaven. The voice of God saying, this is my son, which I love. With him, I am pleased. Now, could you imagine being there for that? 
going home, having dinner. What happened today? Uh, let me try to explain. We probably wouldn't get all of it. But you know what? We have all eternity to figure it out. In verse 9 there, it says that Jesus came from Nazareth, baptized by John. Why? This is a, this is a legit question. Why would Jesus have to be baptized? It's a good question. In fact, Matthew says John asked it. John the Baptist asked it. Matthew 3, but John tried to deter him, saying, I, I need to be baptized by you. And you, you come to me to be baptized? And Jesus replied, let it be so. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And of course, John says, okay. See, Jesus was sinless. He needed no baptism of repentance. And in his baptism, he then what he does is he associates himself with sinners, us, and place himself among the guilty, not for his own salvation, but for whose? Mine. Yours. Not for his guilt, but for who? Mine. Yours. Not because he feared the wrath to come, but to save me from that. To save you from that. You see, his baptism meant the cross. And the beauty of this moment, literally the heavens tearing apart, Holy Spirit coming down as a dove, the Spirit publicly entering Jesus for the empowerment for ministry. And I think that's key because we need to understand here, there was never a time in the life of our Lord when He was not filled with the Spirit. But now the Holy Spirit comes upon Him, anointing Him for His service, empowering and enduring Him with this power. It was a special ministry. Three years of the most intense service possible. A person may be educated when you think about it, talented, fluent, in a lot of different things. But without this mysterious quality, which many people call unction, that service is lifeless and ineffective. You actually see it in a lot of business books. They don't, some of them, when they dig into the business books, it's unction, which is actually being anointed with something a special talent, or as some books call it, the it factor. But this, this is the ultimate. This is the Holy Spirit coming in for this time of ministry. And it does make me ask a question about myself, and maybe you should ask it too, have you experienced that? Have you experienced the Holy Spirit coming into your life, empowering you for the service of the Lord? We'll come back to that in a little while. Jesus hears these words, you are my son whom I love. God God was pleased with the Son's commitment to be a humble servant Savior that would atone for the sins of the whole world. As was mentioned earlier in Isaiah 53. Now, once again, man, I, a lot of people would like to be with great Christian leaders of the past. I mean, how many of you would love to hang out with Paul for a while, Apostle Paul? That'd be pretty cool. How many would like to hang out with Peter? Peter? Peter, I, I, I think John the Baptist would be awesome to be around. 
Have you ever thought about that? We are called to emulate His witness, to preach the whole message, both law and grace. We, we're to preach the, the radicalness of the gospel. In doing so, we do that so that men and women might be drenched with the Holy Spirit through Christ. Christ. We are to have character in our lives that matches the message that we preach. Boy, did John's character match the message. To believe it, to have such sincerity that others sense the ringing of truth, passionately proclaiming it, weeping for the world, exalting Jesus above all. He must become greater, I must become less. You know, there's a lot of people who have been baptized but have never been baptized in the Spirit. You know that? See, all all of us as Christians are called commanded to be baptized in water as a symbol, as an outward expression of what has happened inside. But unless Christ has filled your life and you've accepted the Lord, and when you accept the Lord, when you truly believe in Him, that is when you are baptized with the Spirit. That is when the Spirit enters. The, The waters of baptism for us, is just saying, hey, everyone, this is who I am, a new creation in Him. But there's a lot of people who get baptized who have not been baptized. Been to Israel a few times, and both times I've been there, saw where they do the baptisms uh, in the Jordan, and it's a big, big scene, and a lot of people, you know, pay uh, money to, to get the robes on and, you know, use the shower rooms and all that type of stuff, and they go down there. And for many people, it is a true experience. I'm not saying that it's not, but you've got to know that many people are just doing it because they're there. And we can never be like that as true believers. Unless Christ has penetrated your heart of hearts, unless the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you're not one of His yet. doesn't matter if you've been sprinkled or dipped or dry cleaned. You are not one of His unless you've received the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, His cleansing from sin, the empowerness to godliness. And if you have, you should read this section here with what happened to Jesus with an astonishment of what happens to you. Because Scripture is very clear that when we are in Him, we are His. We are His sons and daughters. We are adopted. Permanently, permanently His. So, maybe you need to be baptized, but let's start with making sure that you've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior for the baptism of the Spirit. And then we will baptize you, letting people know that that is what has already happened. Amen? There are several reasons, like I said earlier, that are fitting for John to be baptized at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. I've already mentioned one. 
Another one was that John was the voice crying in the wilderness, prophesied by Isaiah, calling people to repentance and preparation for the Messiah. And by baptizing Jesus, John was declaring to the, everyone there that he's the one, the Son of God, the one that he had predicted would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here's another one. And I think this one's really important. And if you know anything about what was required of the priests in the Old Covenant, this one is an added dimension that I think people may not know. John the Baptist was of the tribe of Levi, a direct descendant of Aaron. And Luke makes a very specific note that both of John's parents were of that priestly line. It's Luke 1, verse 5. One of the duties of the priests in the Old Testament was to present the sacrifice before the Lord. John the Baptist's baptism of Jesus can be seen, and I think rightly so, as a priestly presentation of the ultimate sacrifice. And John's words, the day after the baptism, has this priestly air, and you can find them in John chapter 1, verse 29. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I think you had there have a priestly presentation of the Lamb of God. It's amazing what can be packed into just a few verses. And then we move on. Because as we saw in verses 9 through 11, heaven had been torn open and the Spirit comes down on Christ. And then all of a sudden, whoo! We're in the wilderness in verse 12. Heaven had opened, and now, boom, hell has opened. Verse 12, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Okay. This is where history really helps in understanding the culture. In Jewish thought, the wilderness was viewed as a place of danger, a place of doom, and the abode of demons. Matthew 12, 43, Luke 8, 29, and eleven twenty-four. 24. The mention of wild animals underscores that idea. The wilderness was a place of loneliness and danger, the realm of Satan. When you, when you traveled through Israel in different places, you know, when David says, well, I, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and I... I, I, I fear no evil. Well, there were just places, if you, if you walked, you were asking for it. They were waiting for you. And so in this wilderness aspect, loneliness, danger, the realms of Satan, Mark's account of the temptation here is brief, records no specific temptation and no victory over Satan. The emphasis that Jesus' entire ministry was one continuous encounter with the devil is really where Mark's at, and it's not limited to the temptations in the desert. Indeed, in his gospel, he vividly describes a continuing conflict. So if you want to find the full temptation discourse, Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11, and, and Luke 4, 1 through 13. But Mark adds these activity details. 
The Spirit drove him into the wilderness. That is a strong word in the original language. Mark uses it 11 times to describe throughout the book of Mark, casting out demons. It does not suggest that Jesus was either unwilling or afraid to face Satan, but it's a way for Mark to show the intensity of the experience. This was not a leisurely walk in the park, and Satan's like, hey dude, how's it going? No time was spent basking in the glory of the heavenly voice or the presence of the heavenly dove. The servant had a task, had a task to perform, and he immediately sent out to do it. And Mark presents us with these two symbolic pictures then. First, 40 days in the wilderness. Huh, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Well, it reminds us of Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Now, Israel failed when they were tested, but what did Jesus do? He succeeded victoriously, triumphed over the enemy. Jesus could now go forth and call the people who would enter into their spiritual inheritance. And it's very interesting that since the name Jesus is the Greek form of Joshua, you can see even that parallel. Second, the second picture is that of the last Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15, the first Adam was tested in a beautiful garden and failed. But Jesus was tempted in a dangerous wilderness and won. Adam lost his dominion over creation because of his sin, but in Christ, that dominion has been restored for all who trust in him. Jesus was with the wild beasts, and they didn't harm him. He gave a demonstration of that future time of peace and righteousness when the Lord will come, establish his kingdom. He is a servant with authority. Amen? These simple verses, 9 through 13, drip with life applications for us today. The first is obedience. Jesus obediently submitted to baptism by John the Baptist. We are called to be obedient to God in our own lives. And that involves acts of faith, acts of humility, and submission to God's authority. Are you living that life in Christ? Another application is what is my identity? Oh boy. Talk about our world messing with this one. Here we see the voice from heaven declaring Jesus as God's loved son in whom he is well pleased. And we are children of God. We find our identity and worth in being loved by God. Knowing that our value and significance come from Him alone. Another thing that we see here is being prepared. After His baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit, drove by the Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. And this time of testing served as preparation for His ministry. And very similarly... God may lead us through, not may, we will have times of testing, challenges. They strengthen our faith, prepare us for our calling in Him. Another thing that we see here is resisting of temptation. 
is once again very important to understand when you look at the narrative of the temptations. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus resisted the temptations of the devil by relying on the word of God. Satan twists. Jesus said, nope, it's actually this. He relied on God's word. When faced with temptations, we can follow that same example by doing what we're called to do all throughout the Bible, turn to Scripture. Pray and allow the Spirit to overcome and resist temptation. We we also see here a dependency on God. Throughout His ministry, Jesus constantly depended on the Father for strength, guidance, provision. I mean, I love what you see there. He was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Dependency on God. Relying on God in all circumstances. Trusting in his faithfulness and his sovereignty. We also know and we see in this a little glimpse of this There is a time of solitude and reflection in here too. Jesus spent time in the wilderness with God, reflecting, preparing for ministry. And we too can benefit from times of solitude and prayer, reflection to deepen our relationship with God, gain clarity on His direction for our lives. And another one, the the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove at His baptism, empowering Him for that specific ministry ahead. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The... Do you believe that? I hope you do. (laughs) It's necessary to believe that. That's what happens. The Spirit equips us with spiritual gifts, equips us with strength and wisdom to fulfill God's purposes in our lives. And by meditating on those truths, His Word, Applying that to our lives, you then grow in faith. You then grow in obedience. You grow in intimacy with God. All the while living out your calling as His beloved children. Let's go back to verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased." The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. When you take some time to kind of go word by word, sentence by sentence through that, you realize God's amazing love for us. That he would have Jesus and Jesus would allow himself to go through all of that for who? 
me, you.